you may have a seat. Well, good morning. Oh, I believe I know just about everybody here, but just in case we have not met yet, I am uh, Andy Gowns, one of the pastors here at East Hartford Baptist Church, and we are super excited that you are here this morning. Um, normally, I have like 15 to 20 minutes of intro material. We're going to skip it this morning. We're going straight to the scripture. Amen? Okay. We're not going to get done any earlier, but, uh, but uh, we're just going to jump straight into the scripture this morning. So if you have your Bibles, chapter 17 of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, we continue our series this morning, and we'll be looking at the first 13 verses of 17. When you get there, say amen. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start. Here we go, verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Now he was transfigured in front of them, and his face shone with the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I will set up three shelters here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down and were terrified. Jesus came up, touched them, and said, Get up, do not be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Do not tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So the disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Elijah is coming, and will restore everything, he replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. According to Matthew and his gospel, the transfiguration takes place about six days after the events of Caesarea Philippi, which uh, Jeremy talked about last week, uh, where we have the confession of, who do you say I am? And it takes place about six months before we get to the final week of Jesus uh, on this side of eternity, on, uh, before the, 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 his death, uh, resurrection, death, burial, and resurrection. I'll get it straight here in a moment. So we're about six months away from that last week. We're about six days away from the confession. What's interesting is, as we look at this story of the transfiguration, it really builds off of what Matthew has just told us in chapter 16. Remember, uh, when we're looking at these gospel stories, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, you can look at all four of them, and while the stories may be similar, sometimes they arrange them in different orders. Amen? Uh, sometimes you're scratching your head trying to figure out when did this stuff happen. Chronology is not as important to our biblical authors as is why they're trying to tell us the story, what they're trying to communicate. And remember, Matthew's point in communicating his gospel is so that you would know Jesus, that you would follow Jesus, and that you would share Jesus. This is his emphasis. This is the main thrust of why he's sharing this gospel. And he arranges his stories in such a way so that it emphasizes this progression. Uh, now, the reason he places this story right here... It's because we're coming right out of those events at Caesarea Philippi. Remember, Jesus has just asked his disciples, who do people say I am? What's the, what's the scuttlebutt in the hallways? What, what's the word on the street? What, what, what's people saying about me, guys? Well, they say you're Elijah. They say that you're a great prophet. They say you're an awesome rabbi. They say that no one's ever been here like you've been here. These are all good things. They're not saying anything bad. That would all be great company to be in. But then Jesus turns the question. I love the way he turns the page there. He says, okay, that's who they say I am. But who do you say I am? The guys that I've been walking with for the last three years. The guys that have been sharing my meals with me. We've been camping out. You've seen what I can do. You've heard what I have to teach. You've been privy to, to, to private sessions that no one else got to hear. Who do you say I am? 
and Simon. Simon Peter makes that bold statement. And I believe it's not just him. I believe he makes it on behalf of the rest of those who are gathered there. You are the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the promised one of Abraham. You're the, 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 the heir of David. You're the, the one that Isaiah spoke about. You are our hope. We're putting everything into you, Jesus. And Jesus says, you're right. And remember that next part. Well, let me tell you what my job is, guys. If you really want to know who Messiah is, let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to die. And then we get all of a sudden, Jeremy did a great job talking about last week. But all of a sudden, you get this next confession, if you will. This anti-confession made by Peter. No, 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 Jesus. Nope. You got it wrong, Jesus. You're not going to die. Don't say that. That's not the Messiah we want. That's not the Messiah we've been counting on. That's not the Messiah that we made plans for. You cannot die. That's not in the plan. And remember, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Now, he's not really saying Peter's Satan. He's saying, get behind me, my adversary. That's not what the mission is. And then he goes into that last part of chapter 16. And this is where I want to focus on because it really hinges over to what we're talking about in 17. When Jesus says, why are you trying to fit me into your mold? Quit trying to reinvent me. You need to deny yourself. That means you need to deny what you want, what you desire, what you think God's about, what you think the Messiah's mission is. Quit trying to tell me what to do and do what I tell you to do. If you want to be my disciple, my follower, you've got to start following. And then Matthew gives us this next story, the transfiguration. Now, on the surface, we could go, woo! Say that with me. Woo! Come on, give me your best Ric Flair. Woo! You got to dip a little bit when you do it. Woo! Come on. You all think I'm nuts. Nothing like the nature boy. But this is an awesome story. Can you imagine you're up on the mount? Remember, you're one of three people. I mean, the rest of them didn't get to go. He didn't ask Judas. He didn't ask Simon the Zealot. He didn't ask Andrew, which I'm kind of disappointed. That's my name. He asked John James. That's big James. John's brother. And Peter. Guys, I want y'all to come up on the mountain with me. Y'all like mountaintops? I mean, you like mountaintop experiences in your spiritual life? Yeah, everybody does. Those moments when you feel like you've reached the top of God, you, there, you can't get any higher. This is as good as it can get until the next one you have. Do mountaintop experiences last very long? They're fleeting. They're a gift from God, I think, but they're fleeting. But these three guys, they get to go with Jesus. And they get up there, and we don't know how long they're there, but while they're there, all of a sudden, Jesus changes. That word, transform, metaphor, let me look at my notes so I can say it right. That's where we get metamorphosis from. We'll just leave it at that. But he changes in front of them. He changes in such a way that it impacts them for the rest of their lives. We're going to talk about it in a few moments. But in that changing, they get a glimpse of Jesus. That would have been awesome. Matthew places this story here for this purpose. If we're going to follow Jesus... If we're going to pick up our cross and deny ourselves and die to ourselves, our ways, the things that we think are important, the, the things that we think God ought to be, and we're just going to listen to what God says and do what God says to do and be re-imaged in God's image in our lives, it's about having a focused faith. Our faith needs to be focused on the right thing. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Let's pray again. Father God, thank you for the chance we have to open your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to look at the scriptures. And Lord, thank you for the fact that you did not leave us unaware of what you were doing. But Lord, instead, you gave us a roadmap of what you desire. God, help us this morning as we dig into your word to understand what you desire in our lives. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
So what I want to do this morning is I want to break down this transfiguration story with this idea of having a focused faith. How do we keep our faith focused and what do we keep it focused on? So there in your notes, if you're taking notes, the first one you're going to look at is be vigilant. Now that word vigilant, vigilant means be on guard, be, be, be concerned with what's going on around you. Stay focused on the right things. Notice what it says there in the first, first two verses. After six days, Jesus took Peter and James, his brother John, led them up on the high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Jesus had a complete metamorphosis in front of them. He's no longer looking like they've seen him all the rest of the days they've been hanging out with him. He is in his glorified state. They're getting a glimpse, a glimpse right now in this moment of the future reality of who Jesus really is. Without sounding like I'm nuts, I may, not, I may sound like I'm crazy. But has anybody ever else had a, an experience where, like for a moment, you just like get your grasp of who God really is? Like it just makes sense all of a sudden. And it, it, it's just gone as fast as it gets there. I can remember as a teenager growing up, I'd have those moments where I'd just be thinking about the things of God, thinking about the stories, thinking about Jesus, thinking about what's going on. And just for a moment, it's as if the bright light was there and it just, I got it. And then it just kind of went away. Can you imagine seeing Jesus the way Jesus really truly needs to be seen? I'm going to tell you, this made a lasting impact on these three guys' lives. Huge, lasting impact. Uh, for, 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 uh, for Peter, Peter, Peter in 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 17, he would write this. He says, For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths, and, and when we made known to you uh, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and said, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him for the majestic glory, glory saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I mean, years later, this is still on Peter's mind. He's not talking about uh, Jesus being glorified in the cross. He's talking about this moment when they're on that mountaintop. And all of a sudden, Jesus isn't looking like Jesus, but Jesus is looking all divine and, 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 and majestic and glorified. And the voice comes out of the heavens. This made a lasting impact impact on Peter. Did it on the same on John. Over in John uh, chapter 1 verse 14, he would write, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. James probably would have written something, but by the time we get into the New Testament church, James is one of the first martyrs. It made such a difference for him. He was willing to give his life up for it. They witnessed something that day that changed them forever. Be vigilant. Focus on the right things. Back in high school, I was a defensive tackle. I had one job as a defensive tackle. The right thing for me to focus on was the ball. If you understand anything about defense, my job as a lineman was to pursue the ball. My focus needed to be on the ball at all times. Everything else is irrelevant. The right thing was the ball. If the ball moved to the right, I moved to the right. If the ball moves to the left, I moved to the left. If the ball drops back, I follow the ball. If the ball comes towards me, that's a good day. My job was to stay focused on the right thing. Everything else was a distraction. What are you focused on? The right things? I'm going to talk to you, the guys in here mainly today. Gals, I invite you to eavesdrop. Not to go home and tell your husbands, well, this is what you're supposed to be doing. But instead, realize that you're supposed to be doing the same things. But men, are you being a godly husband? Are you focused on the right thing that God's called you to? Are you being a godly father? Raising your children under the admonition of God's Word. Challenging them to step up their game. To love God with all their heart, their mind, their soul, their strength. Are you being a biblical provider? Guys, most of us get so focused on a job and making an income that we forget the most important thing we can provide. Is a relationship with God to our families. 
Are you leading them on a path that leads them closer and closer to Jesus? Are you being a biblical protector? I imagine there's probably a few people in the room that uh, have their carry and conceal license so they can carry their weapons and keep their family safe. Amen. Probably got a shotgun in the hallway and a few things here and there. But what about sin? What about corruption? What about brokenness? What about the friends your family hang out with? The things that are invading their brains, their minds? What about the insidious remarks that people make around us? The things we watch on the internet? Are you really protecting your family the way God desires for you to? Is your time God honoring the things that you do for hobbies and habits? Be vigilant. Focus on the right things. Well, if you're focused on the right things, that means beware. Our second B, beware. Don't focus on the wrong things. I love verses 3 and 4. Uh, Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you want, I will set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I mean, wow. I mean, Moses and Elijah are there. They know who it is. They don't have to question it. It's not like, oh, we saw two other people. We're not for sure who they are. Jesus, who are they? No, they knew exactly. Moses representing the Old Testament law. Elijah representing the Old Testament prophetic word. And uh, both of those point toward Messiah. And they're there talking with Jesus. Matthew doesn't tell us what they're talking about, but we get a, uh, a quote from Luke over in Luke chapter 9, verses 30 and 31, that speaking of the same event, he says this, suddenly two men were talking with him, Jesus. And those two men were Moses and Elijah. They appeared in glory and were speaking about Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah show up to talk with Jesus about what's fixing to happen six months from there. They're talking about the Passover week. They're getting him ready. They're, they're encouraging him as to what's going to happen. Now, the right thing to focus on was the glorified Messiah. But they got focused on the wrong thing. They got focused on the fact that Elijah and Moses are there, and we got this cloud that's all bright and colorful. And, whoa, I mean, it's, it's a good day. Let's build some tabernacles. Let's build some little houses so that we can stay here, maybe not forever, but for a long time, and just enjoy what's going on. There's nothing wrong with Elijah and Moses. Moses is the great lawgiver. Elijah is the greatest prophet that's ever been. These are two of the Old Testament heroes. Nothing wrong with wanting to spend time on a mountaintop, amen, in the presence of God, soaking it in. But they got focused on the wrong thing. It kind of goes back to chapter 16. Who do you say I am? You're the Messiah. They'll tell you're right. Let me tell you what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to die for the sins of the world. No, you're not. Get thee behind me, Satan. If you want to follow me, guys, if you want to be my disciples, you've got to quit worrying about what you think my job is and do what I tell you to. I know we're having a great mountaintop experience. Yes, I'm glorified in front of you. You're getting to see something that no one else is going to get to see until I come back again in all my glory. At the end of the days, when I'm cutting through the heavens, everything's going haywire. The world's ending and the new earth is starting. They won't get to see any of that until then. You're getting a glimpse of it right now. But you're focusing on these two other guys who I created, who I brought into existence who are not me. Don't focus on the wrong things. They're focused on the irrelevant, not the mission. Again, back to my days, my great career as a defensive tackle. I'm going to tell you, I was six foot four and 190 pounds. Not very big for a defensive tackle. And even though my main job was to watch the ball, guess what I paid more attention to normally? 
the guy across from me. Because they was normally about five foot six and 250 pounds this way. And I just knew that they was fixing to blow me over and kill me. Now, you've got to do something with the guy in front of you. So you've got to pay a little bit of attention to him. But what was my main attention supposed to be focused on? The ball. But instead, I stayed focused on the guy in front of me. And when that ball was snapped, guess where I normally was? On my butt. Can I say butt in church? Tush. You see, when you get focused on the wrong thing, you can't pursue the right thing. And the wrong thing may not be all that bad. I mean, you've got to pay attention to the guy in front of you. When the ball is snapped, you're going to have to do something with him. You don't want to be back here. You want to be over there. But if you're so worried about the thing in front of you, so focused on the thing in front of you, so focused on the thing that isn't the right thing, you're never going to get to the right thing. The right thing for us men, talking to you guys again, our mission. What's your mission as a husband? I believe our mission as husbands is to help our wives to be everything God intends them to be. The Bible tells us as a husband you're supposed to sacrifice for your wife. Are you giving up what you desire, what you want, what you believe is important so that your wife can be edified, built up, become the, the person that Jesus wants her to be? What's your mission as a father? Your mission as a father is to raise godly children. doesn't mean they're going to be godly, but you're tasked with raising them in a godly fashion. What's your mission as a provider? Make sure your kids and your wife have the Word of God displayed in your life so they can see it being played out in the life of your family. What's your mission as a protector? Man, you need to guard your house and guard your family with every ounce of energy you have against the enemy. What's your mission as a believer with your time? Are your hobbies, your habits, the things that eat up your spare time, are they God-honoring? Are they helping you in your mission or are they distracting you from it? Be vigilant, beware, and be alert. We need to focus on the main thing. Focus on the right thing. Focus on or don't focus on the wrong thing and stay focused on the main thing. We see this in verses 5 through 13 to the end of our section. Now, now I can still hear Coach Shelton. He was our defensive line coach. And boy, Coach Shelton, uh, he was, he's about this tall. And he'd walk over with his hat pulled backwards and those 1970s style coaching shorts on. You know what I'm talking about. He'd reach up and grab my face mask. He'd just jerk it down. It was a different day of coaching. And he'd give me face down to him, and, and he'd just go, you are supposed to. And I was supposed to repeat after him. He would, he would say, you post block, and then you move. Post block, and you move. You of course, he said it much more colorfully with all sorts of other adjectives in there. My job, the main thing, the right thing was to stay focused on the ball. The wrong thing to focus on was the person in front of me. The main thing to focus on was posting, blocking, and moving. Because this is how I get the irrelevant thing out of my way so I can get to the right thing. The basics. Just the basics. Don't worry about doing fancy plays and this and that. My job is to pop up, move the person in front of me, and take after the ball. It's that simple. No matter how big the guy was in front of me. No matter how fast the person was. My job was simple. Pop up, move the guy in front of me, chase the ball. Three things I had to, three things I had to remember. We see here in these last few verses of chapter 17, this first part, three things I think we can focus on as being the main things. One, listen to Jesus. Verse 5, while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It reminds us of Jesus' baptism. The only other time that the heavens opened up and we hear these words, This is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased with, who I love and adore. 
But here we get an extra, extra little uh, commandment. Listen to him. This is not just the Messiah. This is my son. The voice from heaven cries out. He's worth listening to. That's the first thing we need to do in our three basics. Listen to Jesus. That sounds simple enough. Number two, obey Jesus. Verse 6, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down and were terrified. Jesus came up, touched them, and said, get up, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus alone. They were coming down the mountain. Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. There's lots of different things we can look at there, but the main thing I want us to take away this morning is simply this. Listen to what Jesus has to say, and the very next thing Matthew tells us is a command that Jesus gives. Just obey Jesus. Remember a few weeks back we talked about the uh, following the leader and the whole game of follow the leader. How do you play follow the leader? You follow the leader. <laughs> if the leader goes to the left, we go to the left. If he goes to the right, we go to the right. If the leader goes, whoo, there you go. <laughs> I'm going to have fun with that. The deal of it is, though, there's a lot of us who listen to Jesus, and that's where it stops. A lot of us read our Bibles, but does it change the way we live our lives? I, mean, I know what God says about my money, but, you know, it's tough in this world. I'm going to have to do other things with my money to make sure I get what I want. The Bible's pretty clear on how to raise our families, men. But a lot of us are more busy doing the things that work against our families than actually helps build in a biblical, godly manner. And I could just go down that list more and more and more. We need to obey Jesus. And then the third, the third basic is just trust Jesus. Verse 10, so the disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come? Elijah is coming to restore everything Jesus said. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. You see, um, again, lots of implications there. Lots of things that we could unpack. I just don't have time to unpack them all this morning. But I think the takeaway for us is simply this. They asked a question, Jesus answered, and they trusted his answer. What they asked was a tough question. I thought Elijah, I mean Isaiah, all the prophets, Malachi, they talk about Elijah coming. The one who's going to come and, and make straight the path. The one who's going to come proclaiming the, uh, the, the, the one who's coming with the good news is, is on his way. Have we seen Elijah yet? Uh, that wasn't that just him? Is it now? What's going on? And Jesus says, guys, get back to the mission. Elijah's already come. They didn't like, they didn't like Elijah. And they killed him. And they're going to do the same to the Son of Man, to the Messiah, to me. Taking him right back to chapter 16, the mission. Just trust me. Listen to me. Obey me. Trust me. Men, husbands, fathers, are you doing the basics? Are you listening to Jesus? Are you obeying Jesus? Are you trusting Jesus? How do we do that? Are you in the Word daily? I'm going to tell you what, if you're, if you're, this isn't just preacher propaganda. Uh, <laughs> I feel like you all think this is, we have a, 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 a checklist of things we're supposed to say every week, and this is one of them. Read your Bibles. I mean, you all know that. I mean, wouldn't you agree you need to read the, the, the textbook, you need to read the instruction book, you need to read the book that talks about how to live your life if you're going to live it? But yet, are you in your Bible daily? I, I'm going to share something with you. I believe that God put the Holy, if you're a believer in the Lord, if you're a follower, if you're a disciple, God placed the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit, the third person of the deity, the Trinity, inside you. The Holy Spirit, even though Matthew's hand wrote this book, the Holy Spirit 
entered into Matthew and caused Matthew to recall the things that he wanted him to write. And this book is not only written by Matthew, but it's written by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you what, if you pick it up and you'll open it up and you'll start reading it, the Holy Spirit will make it make sense to you. Maybe not the first time, maybe not the second time, maybe not the third time, but if you just stay in it. Man, we just bought a house. Someone say, God help them. Because I got a lot of work to do at this house, Jerry. <laughs> Have you heard the Lord's voice? <laughs> God did not give me with the ability to do things. I've been watching videos on YouTube or wherever that thing is. And I'm almost certain that I could do it. But I'm going to have to watch that video again. And again. And again. And probably have it on like a big screen TV in front of me when I'm doing it. And all I'm trying to do is take a cabinet off the garage wall. Oh, she's laughing, but she knows it's true. <laughs> I am useless when it comes to anything practical. But here's what I know. I'm not dumb. Or maybe I am. <laughs> I know that if I just watch it long enough, I can figure it out. Guys, that's working in myself. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you who wants you to read this word, wants you to know this word, wants you to live this word. He's going to help you make sense of it. Just start reading it, men. Are you praying without ceasing? God wants to talk to you, but you're so busy talking to him about all the other stuff going on in your life, he has no place to talk to you. Prayer isn't about you moving your mouth. Prayer is about you shutting up. Did I say that? I did. Getting quiet and listening to what God has to say. He already knows what you need. He already knows what you're going through. He already knows the. you need to hear from him. Serving joyfully and faithfully. God not only placed the Spirit inside of you, but when He placed the Spirit, He put a giftedness inside of you. Something that you're supposed to be using in the life of the church. And if all you're doing is showing up on Sunday mornings and sitting here in the pew, chairs, you're not living at the full extent of what God has called you to do and to be. And you're not going to understand and realize how awesome your, your relationship with Jesus is. We don't need you to serve, but you need to serve. We'll get the stuff done without you. But you're never going to experience the fullness of what God has in store for you unless you start doing and living the way God designed you to live and to be. Are you part of community? Showing up on Sunday mornings and hanging out isn't community. Are you in a small group, a life group? Do you have a group of, of men and women that you can count on when life gets tough? You need them. And men, what's your home life look like? Are you doing the basics at home? Years ago, Debbie challenged me because uh, I, I come to church. I read, I study, I pray. I do all that stuff at church. When I get home, I just want to go home. Take off the preacher hat. Relax. And Debbie said, you know, your kids never see you reading your Bible. She said, I know you read your Bible. But your kids never see you reading your Bible. Oh. You ain't got to tell me the truth, honey. So I put the Bible next to my chair. And I started reading it at night. So my kids would see me reading my Bible. Because they need to see me reading my Bible. Debbie was awesome when our kids were young. She would go in and say nighttime prayers with them and read little stories to them. I, I never did. Never thought about it. Wasn't raised in that type of household. I look back now and wish I had done differently. But as I was older, I would find opportunities to pray with my kids. I remember many times at college, I'd, be a, I'd, I'd, I'd give them a hug, say goodbye, jump in the car. I'd be five miles down the road, and I'd think, ah, I'd turn around, I'd actually drive back, call them, have them come down out of the dorm to meet me and say, hey, I just want to pray with you. You see, we need to set the tone. Men, we need to set the tone of what it looks like to follow God in our homes.
Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, my follower, then follow me. Don't worry about what you want or what you think. I want you to deny yourself. Deny those things that you think I need to be. Stop trying to create me in your image, your desires, what's comfortable for you. I created you in my image, Jesus said. Be who I made you to be. Who do you say I am? Are you focused on the right things? Or are you focused on the wrong things? Get focused on the main thing. Listen, obey, and trust. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for this story. There, there are so many implications in this story, so many different things we could talk about this morning. I can't imagine what it would have been like to st be there on the mountain with you and to see you glorified, magnified in, in your full divinity just for even a moment. And Lord, it would have been cool to see Elijah, to see Moses. Lord, what, what a wonderful moment for the three of them. It changed their lives forever. It gave them the courage to, to live a life for you when, when you no longer were there. It helped them to get focused on, on living a, a, a focused faith so that they could serve you and follow you and be on mission, even though they didn't understand it. Well, this is a wonderful story. But, Lord, there are wonderful implications for us today. God, help us. Help us to stay focused on the right things. That's you. Help us not to be distracted by the wrong things. That's anything but you. And Lord, help us to do the main things. To listen, to obey, and just to trust the plan you have for us. Lord, as we move into this time of invitation, I just pray that your spirit would speak to us and move us in the right direction. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm.